Hey everyone, I'm going to do a quick review on chapter 12 and 13 out of Klein. So with the nomenclature, which is one of the things you should be practicing, you want to prioritize alcohols over all other functional groups you've had so far. So try to get this as your lowest number. And then following the rules for cyclic compounds, we want to use the smallest set of numbers. So 1, 2, 3, 4, rather than going this way, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, right? So that's not, that's not what you want to do. Okay, so we're going to have 4-bromo, 2-methyl, cyclohexanol. And you can say cyclohexan-1-ol or 1-cyclohexanol. Sometimes you see a 1 in here to emphasize that the hydroxyl group is at carbon 1. Okay, but again, we don't want to number it the other way because you'll have really high numbers and you, that's not necessary. For number two, the IUPAC name again, we want to prioritize alcohols. So instead of going this way, which prioritizes the alkene, and by priority I mean giving the lowest number to, we want to go this way, okay, which is sort of counterintuitive, but the OH gets the priority, so that's why it's numbered this way, okay? Uh, there is no cis or trans or E or Z in this case, so we don't have to worry about that. But if we did have a methyl group here, or we had one here, then you'd have to say cis or trans. And then if we had two, more than two groups, like, you know, one, two, three, or four, then we need to do E and Z. So I won't go over that here, but there are resources for E and Z nomenclature that um, you can look up online. Okay, and this was, I think, covered in chapter 8 or chapter 7. Um, I think you can look that up in the book. I, I forget which chapter. So in this case, we're going to do, a, it's like a pentane, right? But it's a pentene because of this. So pentene, that's where I would start myself. I would start with what is the root? Pentene and then 2-all because it's an alcohol. We should have used the O-L ending. And then 2-methyl, um, and the pentene, the ene, starts at carbon-4. Another way you could say it is 2-methyl, pent, 4-ene, 2-ol. It doesn't matter whether you put the 4 here or the 4 in here. All right, good. Um, uh, this one doesn't, let's see, the other ones pretty much name them as alcohols. You only name this as a hydroxyl group if you have another functional group that takes priority, but uh, alkanes do not take priority, so we would prefer naming it as an alcohol. So this one has to do with the ability of these H's to come off, and the more um, the oxygen negative charge that's remaining stabilized, then the better this is coming off. So uh, I'm looking at the inductive effect of each of these, that's the difference, right, is how electron withdrawing are these groups. So if you look at the location, they all are attached at the third carbon. That makes a big difference because if it's attached closer, it'll have a larger withdrawing effect. Uh, so the only difference is looking at the different halogens we have. Um, fluorine is the most electronegative, so we, we're expecting a greater pull, a little bit of pull, and then still a little bit of pull. What induction means is the ability of the negative charge here to distribute to, through the rest of the molecule. Okay, so here I have um, the greatest effect of charge distribution here because the fluorine has a greater pulling effect due to its electronegativity. So that's going to help reduce the charge on the oxygen more than either of these. Okay, so, so definitely we're gonna say two is the best, and that leaves us with one choice. Okay, so this is the strongest acid. Strongest acid, uh, decreasing order, so they want strong to weak. So it'll be two, and then one, and then three. I think a lot of people will choose this as the strongest just because of fluorine, but may not be able to explain why. So I want you to be able to explain why. Okay, and why that is, is because of induction, this has the greatest effect, the high, high electronegativity of F has the greatest inductive effect. And what that means is that the charge is distributed or delocalized more. So the charge buildup on the oxygen is spread out more or delocalized 
which helps to stabilize this. If you have charge buildup, charge density, that's gonna make this a stronger base. Um, but we want a weaker base where the charge is distributed and the weaker base means a stronger conjugate acid. The product of this reaction, I'm recognizing this as adding um, Markovnikov OH group, right? So I'm sort of thinking of a really simple Markovnikov addition of, of alcohol group. So uh, that's going to put it right here. This is the more substituted carbon, so it should be three. If I wanted anti-Markovnikov, uh, then I probably want one. And one would be with BH3THF followed by NaOH, H2O2. So it's good to know the anti-Markovnikov version as well, in case you're asked about that. This one means that I would need to either have a carbocation rearrangement, which it's not gonna go to secondary, it would go to tertiary anyway, uh, or I would need the alkene to be here so that the OH would add there. So that's not what I'm starting with though. I'm not, I don't have it alkene there. Um, and then this one is where I would have a double bond up here, and then I'd have an anti-Markovnikov OH group add there. Uh, identify the starting material. Yeah, we're looking at adding a CO bond, right? We've increased our number of CO bonds from one to two. So this is a case of um, oxidation. And then if you go in reverse, it should be called reduction. Uh, this one is a reduction uh, because I'm thinking of NaBH4 as if it were a hydride. So these hydrogens are nucleophilic. So I'm thinking about that adding here, and that's going to give me an alcohol. So you can take a look here. That's going to make this into an OH group. Uh, it'll be O minus first, and then the methanol, what that's there for is to neutralize that into an OH group. This double bond is not touched. Um, if I had used H2PT, then this double bond would react with that and with the carbonyl group. So um, in that case, this is if I used H2PT, then answer three would be good. Uh, in our case, we're just looking at uh, one. And it's not a diol because if you know the mechanism, it's just one hydrogen coming in and attacking. Once you make this alcohol, you, there's no other way to get another OH group here unless you use other reactions. For this one, I'm thinking Br2 radical halogenation here, the most substituted. And then uh, if you want to use this, this is a strong base, right? NaOET. It's, it's like NaOH. Okay, so you should think strong base. It's going to remove one of the hydrogens, either here or here. This is a small strong base, not bulky. So if I'm going to use the Zaitsev, I'm going to get Zaitsev elimination. If I wanted this hydrogen to eliminate and make this, then I would want to use KOTBU or TBUOK. All right. So because this is bulky. Um, MCPBA does the epoxide across the double bond and we're going to get both forms dashed and wedged here. Okay, so that's the key there. And then um, after NaOH, H2O2, this is actually a chapter 13 reaction, so my apologies there. The, we learned how to do acid opening, where acid opening is going to give me the Markovnikov addition of H2O. So. What happens here with acid is I protonate this oxygen with the acid, then water comes in the more substituted side. So this is really important for the stereochemistry. If this, o, if this group is in the back, then water comes in the opposite side due to less steric hindrance. Uh, it also has to do with the molecular orbitals though. So if this is coming in opposite of where the epoxide is, then I'm going to have the water become wedged. And then this is let go in the back. Okay, so it's still attached here. There's my remaining parts of the epoxide. 
Now, here's the weird thing is there's steric hindrance also from the methyl group, but it the water comes in opposite to the epoxide ring. OK, so the methyl group has to get pushed to the back to replace the epoxide. So that's the part that a lot of students have questions about. OK, and then water is going to neutralize this. So what I'll end up with here is I'll have this group being an OH like that. And the methyl group will actually go from front to back as the water coming in pushes it. All right, so this is what's going to happen. If I gave you this particular stereoisomer, I would like you to demonstrate what happens to that specific one. OK, but yes, both of them technically form in the solution. All right, notice that these are trans diols. So this means that this OH and this OH are on opposite sides of each other. So that's really helpful to know. MCPBA followed by acid ring opening is going to give you trans diol. All right. Um, also, MCPBA followed by um, sodium hydroxide is another ring opening that will also give you a trans diol, and that's the one that they're showing you here. So what's going on here? We get the opposite stereochemistry. That's what's going on. And why is that? That's because sodium hydroxide is the opposite of acid. It actually does a anti-Markovnikov anti addition. So if we look at the mechanism for that, we're going to take this epoxide we made in step C here, or, or intermediate C. Water came in Markovnikov when we protonated this OH. When we're using base, though, there's no protonation step. And now this OH is just looking for the least steric hindrance. There's more steric hindrance here because of the methyl group, so the OH prefers to come in the opposite way, the less substituted side. So notice why this is wedged. It's because the epoxide is in the back. This OH comes in from the front. And so that's why it's wedged here. And then this epoxide opens in the back. And that's why this is dashed. And notice this side is untouched, OK, because the OH came in on this side. So this is what you're going to get uh, for a base catalyzed ring opening. And this is down here, the acid catalyzed ring opening. So that's a really important distinction that I will probably have a question about on the test. This is a Grignard reaction, I can tell because MGBR. So that makes this part positive. The part it's attached to is negative. So this is my nucleophilic carbon right here. So what I'm going to do is uh, attack there, uh, attack, use that to attack my carbonyl group because that's the dipole here. OK, and so this is the mechanism for a Grignard reaction. Uh, once you do that, then the oxygen. So here's the phenyl ring. Here's the O minus charge. Here's that. OK, and then here's the new group, one, two, three. So one, two, three. And then I'm going to neutralize this with water. OK, H2O. All right, so what I'll end up with is an alcohol group with a phenyl ring my previous isopropyl group and my new propyl group from my green yard. So the answer is one. If you know the mechanism, you can always figure out the answer. You shouldn't be looking at these and just sort of guessing. You really should go through the mechanism. That's why we're learning those. OK, without looking at the answer, I'm just going to analyze this. I'm looking at corresponding this structure to this one. Like one thing that might help is just numbering the chain and sort of figuring out, am I adding carbons? Which carbons are changing? And I am noticing I am adding carbons right here. And in fact, I'm adding a carbon with an OH group. So adding carbon is called alkylation. And when you notice the carbon has an OH group attached, then that's a good candidate for the Green Yard reaction. OK, so what do you need for a green yard? You need an R group with an MGBR. That's your nucleophile. And then you need some kind of carbonyl group. And in this case, you just need a one carbon carbonyl group. So I'm going to put H's here and use formaldehyde. OK, so this is my one carbon right here. 
So that's great. Then I just need to change this into a Green Yard reagent. So I'm going to have MGBR here. And then I'm going to use um, formaldehyde, like I said. And then this will attack here. And then I'll have my carbon with the OH group right here. All right, so what do I need to do then? I need to make sure I add the MGBR here. And the first step is to add HBR and get this into a bromine, alkyl, alkyl halide. And then I'm going to add magnesium to it. And that's going to, step one and two is going to make that. So step one and two are going to make that. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. So we're going to do BR and then we're going to do MGBR. So those are steps one and two. Step three is my formaldehyde. Step four, make sure you put H's, by the way. A lot of people forget. But then if you don't do the H's here, you're going to have carbons. So that's... Um, it's additional detail you want to have, especially if you're going to be a doctor someday, which I know a lot of you want to be doctors. You got to pay attention to details <laughs> or you might kill people. OK, so. All right. There you go. OK, so uh, that last step is because when this attacks here, that's going to be O minus and then you need to neutralize that with water. OK. All right, so I know it seems like uh, extra you don't need to do, but you really should try to remember all these things. Okay, next, the product for the following reaction sequence. Uh, this is tricky because that this is what we call TMSCL, trimethyl silyl chloride. Okay, so just be aware. Um, I, I only put this on here by accident. This is what the... The publisher put so I will use TMSCL though and this is a this is just a solvent for that uh, two three four five okay so in order um, what's going on here oh I have two functional groups where if I had a green yard here MGBR then that's gonna inter that's gonna cause problems because this will want to attack here and neutralize itself. Okay, so I that's when you need to use TSCL or TMSCL. Sorry. All right. So what we're gonna do is after step one TMSCL, we're going to make that into OTMS. That's a protecting group on the oxygen. It keeps the oxygen from reacting. Keeps that hydrogen from reacting by removing it. Okay, that's what this is for. Uh, we'll have TMS, and then we'll have this nitrogen grab the H, by the way. Okay, uh, next we'll do the Green Yard reaction. So MGBR and OTMS. And now this becomes my nucleophile right here. Okay, and that's going to attack here. All right, so what, what do we get? Um, after step four, we're going to, after step three, we're going to have, um, now notice I always draw the arrow from this carbon, but it technically should be coming from this bond because the MG part falls off. So it comes from this bond, MG falls off and it complexes to the O minus that we're going to create. So let me do step three properly here. Okay. So this is attaching to the new group, which is going to be. C double bond O, but the O pi bond breaks off. Okay. And I still have my OTMS right here. And then this is going to get neutralized. But before it does, this is where the MGBR ends up. Okay. So then the water comes in in step four. And this is going to neutralize there. Okay. So then MGBR will be with the OH from the water. Okay, I know I don't go over all of those things in class, so. All right, next we have the green yard then with our neutralized uh, OH group. And then we just need to remove the TMS group because we probably wanted this to be an alcohol right here. Okay, so if you do, then that's what TBAF is for, step five. We didn't go over the mechanism for that. I would say don't worry about it too much because you don't really see it that often. So just go with the flow and use that just to remove that and get your diol. One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, I'm missing a carbon somewhere. 
Yes, I'm missing a carbon. I, I didn't do this step correctly right here. Sorry. So that's why you always want to count and make sure. Okay, so it doesn't look so great, but something like that. 1,4 heptane diol. I went over this earlier with a few students where uh, the question was, how do I know when to use these, you know, TMSCL and TBAF? Like, here's the green yard reaction. How do I know when to do those as well? Uh, again, it's if, if you're trying to do a green yard reaction and you have a hydroxyl group on there, that's when you need to protect it because the green yard will react with any kind of protic hydrogen, whether it's water or alcohol these hydrogens will get attacked by a green yard reagent um, because those are strong bases that will attack hydrogens, okay? The major product for this, now we have something called TSCL. TSCL is not the same as TMSCL. TMSCL is what makes this OH group into a group that's stable. Like nobody will touch this, okay? It's not gonna leave, it's not gonna do any, it's just gonna sit there until you take it off, okay? TM TSCL, tosylate, tosyl chloride, is to make oxygen's OH groups into better leaving groups. So what's gonna happen here is this oxygen will attack here and since it's already wedged, it's going to stay wedged. Okay, so it's going to form a good leaving group. Because remember, uh, OH groups are poor leaving groups because they're strong bases. OTS is a weak base. So it's going to come off. And when it comes off, then I'm going to ha notice, first of all, I, I want to be careful, is this SN1 or SN2? Does the TS come off first and then I have iodine in the next step attack on top and bottom and get a racemic mixture? Or is it SN2? So I'm going to look here and I'm going to say, okay, this carbon right here is attached to two carbons, so this is secondary. If I have primary, secondary, I'm going to do SN2 most of the time. If I have tertiary, I have to do SN1, where it has to leave first and make room for a nucleophile to come in. And here I have a good, good nucleophile, like iodide, so it's especially going to do SN2, where it attacks. Okay, so it's going to attack from the opposite side, so the iodide better be in the back. All right, so the best the answer is number three. Uh, for this, I'm going to notice the change. So it's an oxidation step. So for oxidation, I need to make sure I use oxidizing agents. Let's go through all the possibilities. Here, this is making a ketone. There is no aldehyde versus carboxylic acid possibility, so you can always use PCC for that. You can also use sodium dichromate, which is what they have in the answer here. You could use something called Jones reagent, which is chromium trioxide and acid. Uh, any of these kinds of oxidizing agents with chromium and potassium permanganate. Notice all these oxygens, okay? And then these also have oxygens with chromium, all right? So use your chromium reagents and lots of oxygens uh, for oxidation. Uh, PBr3 was replacing the OH with the Br. So we're going to have this. And one, two, three, four. Okay, so be familiar with that. If we wanted a Cl here, then use Sokol SOCl2 thionyl chloride. Next, we're going to put a magnesium into that, insert it between the carbon bromine bond. So now we're making a Green Yard reagent. That makes this carbon nucleophilic, so it's going to attack here. And then we're going to get a 1,2 carbon addition uh, right here. Here's my carbon addition with the OH group. Okay, it'll be OH after neutralization. All right, so there's my new group. Okay, so just looking at the beginning here, um, here was my carbon chain right here. So just thinking about synthesis, you know, if you were to look at the starting material and look at the end, notice that you're adding 
this group. And remember, you're adding an R group with an OH group. So that means use a green yard reagent. Ooh, IR. I really love this group here, right? That's OH. Um, so this here is CH for SP3 because it's less than 3,000. If it's sort of 3,100, if we see a peak here, it's usually a pi bond, uh, like a C double bond CH. Um, I'm going to look for, yeah, so there's triple bonds here. And so we definitely know that there's OH groups here, okay? If it was a carboxylic acid, though, this would be have the additional C double bond C at 1700. So that's really important to look for. Here's 1500, 16, 17. There's nothing here, so no C double bond O. Uh, this peak here is probably from the alkyne CH, right? So, or actually the C, C triple bond C uh, is right here, 20, 21, 2200. Okay, you may or may not know this, and at this point, it should be okay. Either one is fine. Uh, let's see, though. What is the main difference, then? Um, we've got a CH bond here versus here there's no CH. Okay, so we need to see a CHSP. Okay, so uh, we, we don't usually see those, so you can look that up. Um, this is going to have a higher frequency than a sp3, so it would be above 3,000 here, okay? And in fact, it's around 3,300, so this little blip right here is the probably that CH bond from an alkyne. That's a tough one, okay? I don't think I would probably give you something that hard. I didn't realize uh, how subtle that was. So, um, yeah, that's how you would do that. I, I would probably want to make sure that you guys could see, like, maybe something like that. Okay, so that was just poor resolution there. But if you said one or three, I think I would accept that. Okay. Which of the following compounds are classified as ethers? So anything basically with R group on either side of the oxygen. So all of them are. Least soluble in water is the alkane because we have no oxygens. Uh, ethers, even though they're pretty nonpolar, uh, you guys know diethyl ether does not dissolve very well in water and we get two phases. Some amount of this does dissolve. So uh, it is somewhat um, uh, soluble because it does have the ability to form hydrogen bonds with water, okay, to some extent, okay. Predict the products for the following reaction. So excess HBr and heat. By the way, we, we didn't cover nomenclature here too much, so maybe it's a good idea to sort of practice diethyl ether, uh, methyl propyl ether, okay, one butanol. Oh, sorry, two butanol, which is what I just drew. All right, and then uh, pentane. Predict the products for the following reaction. This is going to be um, our negative charge. This is our positive. So we're going to protonate the ether. And then you're going to have the Br minus that can attack either one of these partial positive carbons. Okay, in this case, it doesn't matter because of symmetry. So we're going to have OH plus. Br, okay. Uh, so in this case, um, excess though excess Br me HBr means I can go again. So this now can attack HBr again, and then I'm gonna have um, this protonated, and then the Br minus can come in and do the exact same thing as before. So I'm gonna end up with making one two. Uh, oops, and I made a mistake here. This should have been a propyl. So here's the propyl, and then here is the ethyl. Okay, so these are my two products. Predict the product for the following reaction. Provide a curved arrow mechanism. Okay, so notice 
again, two functional groups, so something special is going to happen. So just, you know, mental note. This is hydroxide. This is my positive charge, okay? So alcohols have an acidic hydrogen that you need to be aware of. Once we have that, then we're going to do uh, an analysis. My positive charge is here because of the dipole, and then my negative charge is here. So this is going to want to attack here and close the ring and do an intramolecular SN2 reaction. Intramolecular within the same molecule. Okay, so what that's going to give me is let's do a let's do a count. Okay, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, six bonds between those groups. Okay, so I'm going to make a six-membered ring. And then if you want to, you can number it one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, and then uh, from there. Uh, let me remove that. Okay, so from there I can number this one, um, two, three, four, five, six. Notice six has a methyl group on it, so I'm going to stick that there. Predict the product for the following reaction. Now, one thing I'm going to say is we didn't specifically go over this in class. So this is a homework problem you may have seen. And it's just to get you to think about ways that we can make epoxides, okay, or rings, cyclic ethers can be formed by just this idea of an SN2 reaction where you create a nucleophile within the same molecule. So that's really useful to know about because you see that a lot um, in Chem 262 and 263. So for this one, this is an epoxide ring opening. And recognize whether it's an acid or base. We have an acid. So this is acid opening is going to be Markovnikov. Now let's go through the mechanism for this. Okay, the oxygen is going to get protonated. And it's currently in the back. So let's use the same stereoisomer that they give us. And then from here, the bromide is going to attack Markovnikov. So that means the brom bromide is going to come in on the more substituted side. And it's going to come in from the opposite side. So if this is dashed, we're going to come in wedged. Okay, so this is going to be wedged. All right, so let's take a look at that. First, it's got to be Markovnikov. The BR is going to be on the left. Okay, and then it's going to be wedged. And then the other group is going to become an OH group. So this is not correct. This is correct. So the answer is 1. So you have to know it's both Markovnikov addition, which means the BR is on this carbon, not on the other one. And then it's also anti-addition, which means it's going to be trans to the OH group. Okay, so they're on opposite side. And you want to make sure you have the right stereoisomer. If they're starting with 1, you want to end up with the one that came from that particular isomer. This one is an epoxide ring opening as well. This is a basic solution of cyanide ion. Okay, so this is base. If you're not sure what's acidic and basic, um, mainly you're going to be looking for the hydrogen. Then it's acidic, okay, H+. Otherwise, it's going to be basic. All right, so cyanide is going to come in the less substituted side, which here it doesn't matter which side, but it is going to come in opposite attack. So this is dashed. This is going to come in wedged. So I'm looking for a wedged CN. All right, so there we go. And that's it. Okay, so it walks you through. Uh, chapter 12 and 13, notice that the 13 we covered some of these reactions where you had epoxide ring opening acid versus base, so definitely know the difference between that. You had um, ether cleavage, and then we had an ether synthesis. Okay, those are the three ether reactions you should know, along with some background information on what are ethers, how do you name them, and what are their properties in terms of water solubility and melting point or boiling point. IR, you should definitely know the OH and the C double bond O. Um, you should know about PBR3 and some of these reactions with alcohols. Uh, oxidation and reduction of alcohols. And the Grignard reaction and protecting groups. 
All right, good. And then we know sort of how to make epoxides, a few multi-step synthesis ideas here from chapter 11. We also have reduction, okay? And we have addition reactions from chapter eight. But really try to focus on the new reactions, chapter 12 and 13. I'm gonna ask um, maybe a little bit about previous reactions, but really try to focus on the new stuff here.